welcome to a new video from Jogler 66 Hour of the Truth. Yes, I know the introduction was about the another part, the next part reading on the secret history of the Jesuits, and I'm going to do that also. But first, I want to share with you something else. Today is the 26th of um, August 2017. And I just saw a video from a brother in Christ who gave me all the audios of Behind the Door, you know, that series from Bill Hughes that I produce on my second YouTube channel, Jocklas War on Disinfo. And um, that was a video with Bill Hughes, and um, the video is called Three Angels Over Africa, Pastor Bill Hughes. He uploaded that today. So why am I going to show you this? Because I took a screenshot at 7.38 and I want to show you this. Bill Hughes makes the horn sign. His other finger shows down from the other hand. He makes this sign for a few seconds. He really takes his hand from another position up to his chest and makes that horn sign as you can see it there. I don't know what to think about that. I thought Bill Hughes was a saved again, a born again Christian. I don't know. That's my understanding of it. But would a born again Christian in a lecture do this horn sign for several seconds? And there's one of my listeners, I think it was James Sampson, if I'm not mistaken who put in the description box uh, in the in the in the comment section of the of the videos behind the door that Bill used this did this I said well he doesn't do that in my videos and of course he doesn't because I produced the videos and I never had a picture of doing him this and I even never saw him doing that but uh, today it really flashed my eyes and I flashed my eyes and I saw this and well, you know what I think about Seventh-day Adventist Church and um, who really controls them from the beginning. And even though Bill Hughes is out of the Seventh-day Adventist cult, uh, officially, he still keeps on teaching, even also all that diabolical teachings like uh, investigative judgment and all that stuff, which is to me absolute heresy. But that's maybe for another video. But I just wanted to share this with you, that a few, well, half an hour before I started this recording, I watched this, because I didn't finish the video, you see it is at 7 minutes 38, I didn't finish it yet. Um, and he makes the sign, and he makes it very, very obvious. So, I just wanted to share that with you guys, and everybody, of course, has to make up his own mind what he thinks about that. But... Um, I was uh, kind of a surprise. I didn't expect that from Bill Hughes. I surely did not. Anyway, this little introduction on Bill Hughes was necessary, I think. And now we are turning to read the book The Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris. We have arrived in section 4 on chapter 7, The Jesuits in France from 1870 until 1885 a very important uh, part of French history that a lot of my American spectators probably do not even know. But, uh, you know, in 1870 or 1871, the French lost the war against Germany and Germany put up under Bismarck the Second Reich, which ruled until 1918, the end of the very first world war. And what did the Jesuits in the meantime do between 1870 and 1885 when we had in Deutschland the Kulturkampf or the culture fight of Bismarck against the Pope? What did the Jesuits do in France in that time? It's interesting to read a little bit of French history because also we must not forget the French have a very special relationship with the United States of America because it was the French that donated the Statue of Liberty to the Americans, right? So let's dig a little bit into the history of the Jesuits in France from 1870 until 1885. 
The collapse of the empire should, it seems, have brought about a reaction against the ultramontane spirit in France. But it was not so, as Adolphe Michel shows. Quote, when the throne fell into the mud of Sedan on the 2nd of December, when France was definitely defeated, when the Assembly of 1871 met at Bordeaux, while waiting to come to Versailles, the clerical party was more audacious than ever. In all the disasters befalling the homeland it spoke as master. Who wouldn't remember the Jesuits' presumptuous manifestations and their insolent threats during these past few years? Like a certain father Marquigny announcing the civil burial of the principles of 1789, or Monsieur de Belcastel on his own authority dedicating France to the sacred heart, the Jesuits erecting a church on the hill of Montmartre in Paris, and so defying the revolution, the bishops prompting France to declare war on Italy in order to re-establish the temporal power of the Pope. Here we have another reason to study the time frame that I mentioned earlier, between 606 and 1866 of the 1260 year prophecy of the Bible. Time, times and the dividing of time, 42 months and 1260 day years. One more reason, because even this Adolphe Michel quotes this here, that in order to re-establish the temporal power of the Pope that has just been lost in 1866, a few years before this. Now, you may ask yourself, um, while waiting come to Versailles, what does that mean? Well, in Versailles there was signed the peace treaty after the war of 1870-1871 with the German Reich that France lost. And the Germans humiliated the French by going to Versailles and sign their peace treaty of defeat in that wonderful castle of Versailles, just outside of Paris that you probably know from when the Germans <laughs> on there they, they, they got their revenge, the French the France got their revenge on the Germans in 1918 when they ordered the Germans to come to Versailles to sign the total surrender after the very first world war you know so this is kind of like a game you know sometimes these, sometimes those and then we read about that the Jesuits erected a church on the hill of Montmartre in Paris that one is called Sacre Coeur. I want to see if I have, yeah, I have this picture here. I have even two pictures here. And the very first picture is deals with the construction, the time of the construction of Sacre Coeur. So this is Montmartre. The Mont means mountain. So this is on the hill of Montmartre in Paris, where the Sacré-Cœur, you can see, is going to be erected. This is a photograph from the 10th of March, 1882. And then, of course, you have here the complete church when it was finished and as it looks today, Montmartre. On the hill of Montmartre, Sacré-Cœur. Sacre cœur means holy heart. Uh, sacred, sorry. Sacred heart. <laughs> yeah. So, Gaston Bali explains very well the reason for that apparently paradoxical situation. Quote, During that cataclysm, the Jesuits, as always, quickly went back into their hole, leaving the Republic to get herself out of the, middle, uh, out of the muddle as best as she could. But when most of the work had been done, when our territory was delivered from the Prussian invasion, the black invasion started again and pulled the chestnuts out of the fire. The land was just emerging from a kind of a nightmare, a terrible dream, and it was just the right time to get hold of the panic-stricken masses. The Prussian invasion was the German military, of course, that beat or defeated the French military in the war of 1870-1871, and the black invasion, of course, is the invasion of the Jesuit priests. But it is not the same. Uh, but is it not the same after every war? Is it an incontestable fact that the Roman Church has always benefited from the great public disasters? 
death, misery and sufferings of every kind incite the masses to search for elusive consolations and in pious practices. In that way, the power of those who let loose these disasters is strengthened, if not increased, by the victims themselves. As far as that is concerned, the two world wars had the same consequences as the one of 1870. Then France was conquered. On the other hand, it was a brilliant victory for the Company of Jesus when in 1873 a law was passed allowing the building of a basilica of the Sacred Heart on Montmartre Hill. So you see still the picture of Sacré-Cœur, Sacred Heart, Montmartre Hill, this church. This church, said to be a national wish by a cruel irony, no doubt, was going, was going to materialize in stone the triumph of Jesuitism at the place where it commands its life. At first glance, this invocation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, extolled by the Jesuits, may seem, though basely <coughs> idolatrous, quite innocent. To realize the danger, wrote Gaston Bally, we must look behind the facade, witness the manipulation of souls and see the aim of their various associations. The Brotherhood of Perpetual Adoration, the Brotherhood of the Guard of Honor, the Apostolate of Prayer, the Reparative Communion, etc., etc. The Brotherhoods, Associates, Apostles, Missionaries, Worshippers, Zealots, Guards of Honor, Restorers, Mediators and other Federates of the Sacred Heart seem to intend exclusively to, as Mademoiselle Alacoque invited them to, unite their homage to those of the Nine Choirs of Angels. So in reality it is far from innocent. The Brotherhood stated their aims many times. They couldn't accuse me of slandering them. I will but quote a few passages from their most clear declarations and gather up their confessions. Public opinion was shocked with the remarks of Father Olivier when the victim of the Bazaar of Charity were buried. The monk had seen in the catastrophe only another proof of divine clemency. God was saddened by our mistakes and was inviting us gently to make amends. This seemed monstrous. The building of the Basilica en Montmartre was a result of the same thought, but this was forgotten. What was then the terrible sin France had to confess? The aforementioned author answers, The Revolution. The Revolution was a terrible sin that France had to confess on. Now, who understands why you have to confess of making a revolution? Well, I guess everybody who saw me reading or listened to my reading on Rulers of Evil. To understand this better, why revolution is a sin, I have to refer you to my reading of Rulers of Evil where it is clearly explained why revolutions like the French and also the American Revolution are a sin. I think it is in chapter 24 or chapter 25, so really to the end of the book of Rulers of Evil. When we get there, that you understand that when you analyze it biblically, that every revolution, as it is stated here, yeah, oh, why does it take the whole sentence here? That every revolution that is also going along with bloodshed can never install a Christ-like government. That's why they needed the War of Independence to get the United States of America off the hook of the so-called yoke of Protestant England at that time. Because without the shedding of blood it was not possible to erect the new American government out of the colonies. If that would have been a bloodless revolution, it would really have been a Christ-like government. But that was not the intention, since the United States of America is prophetically meant to become the second beast of Revelation 13, the beast out of the earth. 
So what was then the terrible sins France had to confess? Well, the same terrible sin America has to confess on their revolution that led to the war of independence. And of, in France, of course, of the revolution of 1789. Continuing, and the Basilica of the Sacred Heart symbolizes France's repentance. Sacratissimo Cordi Jesu Galioe Poenentins et Devote, which stands for Sacred Heart of Jesus, Galli, Repentant and Devoted. It expresses also our firm intention to repair the wrongdoings. It is a monument of expiation and reparation. Save Rome and France in the same name of the Sacred Heart became the anthem of the moral order. So we were able to hope against all hopes, wrote Abbe Brugret, and expect from the pacified heaven some time or other the great event of the restoration of order and the salvation of the homeland. It seems though that quote unquote heaven angered with the France of the rights of man was not pacified enough by the erection of the famous basilica, the three candle snuffers as the restoration of order or rather the monarchical restoration was slow in coming. The same author explains it in the following manner. Quote, Even though the grandiose manifestations of the Catholic faith during the years following the War of 1870 may seem impressive, it would be a lack of the sense of observation if French society of that epoch was judged only on the grounds of that exterior piety. We would also be lacking in psychological spirit and be outside the truth. We must wonder, then, if the religious sentiment was a direct answer for the whole of that society to the expression of faith revealed by the imposing pilgrimages organized by the bishops and the earnestness of the masses and the churches. Without wanting to attenuate in any way the importance of the religious move in France, brought about by the two wars of 1870 and 1914, which also raised such high hopes, we must nevertheless admit that this revival of the faith had not the depth nor the extent which a true religious renewal would have. For even then, the Church of France was unfortunately compromised, uh, comprised, sorry, for even then, the Church of France was unfortunately comprised of not only thousands of unbelievers and adversaries, but also a very large number of those who were Catholics only by name and not conviction. Religious practices were performed not by conviction, but rather from habit, or you can also say tradition. Now I highlighted by name. Why did I highlight that? Well, first of all, let's change the picture in the meantime, otherwise you all guys fall asleep when I always <laughs> show the same picture. <laughs> Why did I highlight by name? Well, when we read this again, it says here, also a large number of those who were Catholics only by name and not conviction. What is this? These by name Catholics are what we call in other places liberals. When you remember the oath of the Jesuits, they are sworn to extirpate from the face of the earth not only the Protestant but also uh, Protestants but also the liberals. What are the liberals? Well, the liberals are people who are Catholics by name who perform religious practices not by conviction, because of belief, but because of habit, because of the tradition. Like, I think you can compare that with the same time when, when, uh, when, when I got my confirmation, when I was 13 or 14 years old. I went to church at that time and got my confirmation. I had no idea what that was all about, and I didn't believe in God. I just was there to collect some presents, some gifts. <laughs> you know, I did not believe in God at that time. And of course, you have Catholics who go to church and even pray, but not because they are convicted, not because they believe, but because it is a habit. 
it is a tradition to do that. Oh, we have done that all through the generations, so I'm going to go the same as my grandfather did, and my father did, and I go, and my son goes, and my grandson goes. You know? It's been tradition for five generations, and even longer, so I'm going to do it. And here, at that time, we had in the Church of France many, many people who comprised the Catholic Church of France with Catholics who were only Catholics by name and not by conviction. So these liberals is first and for all something that, has to, that they have to get rid of, or second of all, that they have to convert to conviction. That's where the word convert comes from, you know? So, you know the prerogative of the Roman Catholic Church, convert or die, right? So you have to um, perform all these religious practices, especially the sacraments, the sacraments of the Holy Mass. For example, with the transubstantiation, you have to do that by conviction, not because of it's a habit, because Jesus Christ said, you do this in remembrance of me. But the Roman Catholic Church says, no, 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 no. This is the real body, blood, soul, humanity, divinity and flesh of Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe that, you are anathema. So you cannot be a liberal within the Roman Catholic Church. And here, for even then, the Church of France was unfortunately comprised of not only thousands of unbelievers and adversaries, but also a large number of those who were Catholics only by name and not of conviction. So they had to, well, re-empower the Roman Catholic Church in France, that these unbelievers and adversaries and liberals would be in the minority in the future. So continue reading. Soon after it was done, France seemed to regret the desperate move which made her send a Catholic majority to the National, to the National Assembly. For five months later, she reversed her position at the contra, uh, con, complen, complementary elections of the 2nd of July. On that day, the country was to elect 113 deputies. You know? Those are elect people representing, quote-unquote, the people in Parliament. It was a complete defeat for the Catholics and victory for between 80 to 90 Republicans. All the elections following that consolation of universal suffrage had the same character of Republican and anti-clerical opposition. It would be childish to pretend that they were not the expression of society's sentiments and wishes." Unquote. Now, we have to understand that maybe that was a kind of a defeat for the Roman Catholic Church when 80 to 90 Republicans from the 100, uh, 118 elected deputies that we speak about here um, were presented by uh, Republicans. That was a defeat for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church in the meantime has learned and today, all these 80 to 90 Republicans, if we have them, would have them again, they, were, they are today all obedient to the Roman Catholic Church. That's the difference between 1870 and 2017. And that time you really had 80 to 90 really deputies that were Republican. Today you have, let's say, you have here 23, yeah, when we call 90 Republicans, and 23 from the 113 are Roman Catholic. Today you have maybe the same. It's not true, but let's even imagine that. But these 90 Republicans are all Jesuit and Roman Catholic controlled. So it doesn't matter anymore. But we weren't that far at that time. Now continuing the reading, the Abbe, uh, Abbe Brugret always a difficult name for me, I don't know why, it's, it's so easy. The Abbé Brugeret, speaking about the great pilgrimages organized at that time for the uplifting of the country, admits that they were the cause of some mistakes and excesses, which aroused the suspicions of the church's adversaries. 
the pilgrimages will be for them enterprises organized by the clergy for the restoration of monarchy in France and pontifical power in Rome. Did you understand that well what I just read here? A very important sentence. I'm going to repeat this once again after I highlighted it so that you can see it better. The pilgrimages will be for them enterprises organized by the clergy for the restoration of monarchy in France and pontifical power in Rome. Pilgrimages like to Lourdes and other quote-unquote holy sites or sites where the quote-unquote Virgin Mary appears. This Mary apparitions. These pilgrimages will be for them enterprises organized by the clergy, by the people of the Roman Catholic Church, for the restoration of monarchy in France and pontifical power in Rome. Now, why is this so important to understand? Yeah, but monarchy in France, okay, what does that have to do with it? Well, a monarchy is always a dictatorship. It's simple as that. On the one hand, you have the government of the people, by the people and for the people, where the people rule, yeah, like in a real republic, like in a real democracy, you have the people, you have the rule of the people, and on the other hand, you have absolute uh, kinds of uh, of rule, like a dictatorship or a monarch. A monarch is an absolute ruler, a sovereign, yeah, and the monarch is only a monarch because. He is there by the quote-unquote grace of God. When we understand the grace of God being the grace of the Roman pontiff, the Antichrist. And because for the Antichrist it is easier to control one king who controls his people than to control a democracy or a republic, that is why the syllabus of errors that we read about in the previous chapter was written by Antichrist Pope Pius IX and in it condemns all governments of the people, by the people, for the people, like democracy and like republics. So this is why this is a very important sentence. The pilgrimages will be for them enterprises organized by the clergy for the restoration of monarchy in France and pontifical power in Rome so that we can go back to ultramontanism. And the attitude taken by the clergy on these two aims will look like justifying this accusation from the irreligious press and will give on that account, as we shall see later, a mighty impetuous to anti-clericalism. Without breaking away from its religious habits, revived so much during the years after the war, French society will rebel against his, this government of priests, as Gambetta stigmatized it. Deep down, the French people had kept an invincible instinct of resistance against anything which even vaguely resembled the church's political domination. On the whole, this nation loved religion, but the specter of theocracy revived by the opposition press frightened, uh, by the op revived by the opposition press frightened it. The eldest daughter of the church did not want to forget that she was also the mother of revolution. <laughs> now, this was quite a handful that we just read, right? So, I'm going to explain this a little bit. Deep down, it says, the French people had kept an invincible instinct of resistance against anything which even vaguely resembled the church's political domination. For this to understand, you have to understand that there was a kind of a Roman, uh, that there was a kind of a Catholic Church in France, as there also was a kind of a Catholic Church in the United States of America. I say was because it is not today anymore. But when we go back to the beginnings of the United States of America as a nation in 1776, and we see the influence of the Carroll brothers, Daniel, Charles, and uh, and John Carroll especially John Carroll, who became the first Catholic uh, 
uh, bishop and opened the Diocese of Baltimore in 1808. When we see that, we understand, we have to understand that the French, all through history, accepted the Pope as their spiritual leader, but they did not accept the Pope as their temporal leader. So as you remember from seeing the Vatican flag with the silver key that, that resembles the temporal, the civil power, and the golden key that is laid over it, and that resembles the spiritual power, you know that the Roman Catholic Church is different from all the other beasts, the Vatican is different from all the other beasts, because it has church and state combined. And wherever you have a government of the people, by the people, for the people, of which the basis, of course, is the Bible, the true word of God, you always have a split between the church and the state. You don't want the church to run the state. Why? Because the Dark Ages showed what happens when the church runs the state. Inquisition, killing of millions and millions of people at that time. And the French always had the problem, and that is why they are called the Gallic uh, uh, Catholics, they did not accept the temporal power of the Pope, only the spiritual one. And this is what this is dealing with, and you have the same with the United States of America. John Carroll, and I refer to this if you want to get a... Um, if you want to get a... Uh, confirmation of what I'm saying right now, then you have to go to the reading of Tom Fress of uh, the Global Vatican uh, on uh, First Amendment Radio, and you can also look that up on YouTube. Uh, while reading that book, Tom Fress mentioned that there was a meeting or a, a letter written, I think it was a letter written from John Carroll, yeah? you know, John Carroll, the founder of Jesuit Georgetown University, okay, let me just look him up here. Then we can have a picture of him in the meantime. Uh, that John Carroll, the statue here in, in front of uh, the Georgetown University as the founder, that he wrote a letter to the Pope in the beginning of the 19th century or the end of the 18th century stating Mr. Pope, Mr. Antichrist, Leave us here in America alone. We, as Catholic Church in the United States of America, cannot accept you as the head of the temporal power for the moment, because otherwise we will be overrun by the Protestants. Because at that time, at 1776, you only had, what was it, less than 2% Catholics in the United States of America. All the rest were Protestant or Jews, other denominations. I, I don't even want to call Roman Catholicism a denomination of Christianity, but anyway, you understand the jest, because otherwise we're getting here into casuistry and sophistry, and I don't want to get too complicated. But John Carroll wrote a letter to the Pope saying, we have to make our own hierarchy here, and we have to play a little bit undercover, because otherwise we will be... Uh, we will get really in trouble here in the United States of America. So that the Roman, uh, that the Catholic, not the Roman, that the Catholic Church in the United States of America at that time did not profess to obey the Pontifex Maximus in Rome. That was the only reason how this Roman Catholic Church could have survived in the beginning years of the United States of America. Today, of course, they accept the supremacy of the Pope. You remember Obama when he said, Holy Father, when he invited Pope Benedict at the time of was, no, Pope Francis, uh, I think it was even, uh, wasn't that? And, and, yeah, yeah, I have that, uh, that video, yeah? Uh, when he invited Pope Francis there uh, into the White House, you know? Every American president now calls the Pontifex Maximus the Caesar of the Roman Empire, the Antichrist of the Bible, the Holy Father. So today, yeah, okay, that has changed, but in that time, the Americans did not accept, or 
the American Catholic Church could not accept the supremacy of the Pope at that time, because otherwise they probably would have, been, would have been killed off by the Protestants who had the majority in that country at that time. Okay? And yet the same with the French. That's why it says here, deep down, the French people had kept an invincible instinct of resistance against anything which even vaguely resembled the church's political domination, the temporal domination. On the whole, this nation loved religion, but the specter of theocracy revived the opposition, uh, the opposition press frightened it. The eldest daughter of the church did not want to forget that she was also the mother of revolution. The eldest daughter of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, the eldest daughter was what? The Church of France. Why do you think the popes throughout the history fled to France or were brought to France? Yeah, that has a reason that we have this wine called Chateauneuf du Pape, huh? the new castle of the Pope. In Orange, in the south of France, where you have that city and the wine region over there. The eldest daughter of the church, France, did not want to forget that she was also the mother of revolution. Yet the clergy with the Jesuits at their head were making such efforts to persuade the French people to abjure the republican spirit. Quote, Since the Falou law was enforced, the Jesuits expanded freely their colleges where they brought up the children in the ruling middle classes and they obviously did not teach them a great love for the Republic. No, of course not. When the Jesuits are in charge of education, they teach Roman Catholicism, Ultramontanism and not Republicanism. As for the assumptions created in 1845 by the intransigent father Dalzon, they wanted to give back to the people the faith it had lost. But there were many other envious, flourishing teaching congregations. Oratorians, Eudists, Dominicans of the Third Order, Marianists, Marists, which Jules Simon called the second volume of the Jesuits bound in ass's skin, and the famous brothers of the Christian schools, better known under the name of Ignorantins, which doesn't come from ignorance, but probably from Ignatius, who taught the good doctrine to the offsprings of the middle classes, as well as to more than one and a half million children of the quote-unquote ordinary people. It is not surprising that this situation put the Republican regime on the defensive. A law proposed in 1879 by Jules Ferry wanted to remove the clergy from the councils for public instruction into which they had been introduced by the laws of 1850 and 1873 and give back to the state's faculties the exclusive right to grade the degrees of the teachers Article 7 of this law also specified that no one would be allowed to take part in public or free teaching if he belongs to an unauthorized religious congregation. <laughs> now, what is an unauthorized religious congregation? Yes, every religious congregation outside of the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuits are aimed at before anyone else in that famous Article 7. The priests of the Deanery of Moray, or saint Marne, will declare then that they are on the side of all religious communities, including the venerable fathers of the Company of Jesus. To strike them, they write, is to strike ourselves. Uh, who's going to do that? Huh? The confession is explicit. The Abbé Brugret, who wrote that passage, describes the resistance put up by the Catholics against what he calls a treacherous attack, but he adds, quote, the clergy still ignore the immense, sorry, the immense progress of the laity. It has not understood yet 
that because of its opposition to the principles of 1789, it has lost all deep influence over the direction of public spirit in France. Unquote. Article 7 is rejected by the Senate, but Jules Ferry invokes the, insisting laws, the existing laws concerning the congregations. In consequence, on the 29th of March 1880, the Journal Officiel contains two decrees compelling the Jesuits to break up and all unauthorized congregations of men and women to obtain recognition and approval for their regulations and legal status within three months. So, in other words, obtain recognition and approval for their regulation and legal status within three months or get out of here. Without any delay, a movement of opposition is organized. The church, deeply wounded, is aroused, according to M. Debidur. After the 11th of March, Antichrist Pope Leo XIII and his nuncio express a grievous protestation. Quote, now it is the turn of all the bishops to defend energetically the religious orders. Unquote. The sons of Loyola were nevertheless expelled. But let us listen to what the Abbe Brugret has to say on that subject of the, expel, uh, of the expelling of the Jesuits. Quote, In spite of all, the Jesuits, experts of at re-entering through the windows when they have been thrown out through the door, had already been successful in putting their colleges into the control of laymen or secular ecclesiastics. Even though not residing in these colleges, they could be seen coming in at certain times of the day to perform duties of direction and supervision. Unquote. Now let me read this again. In spite of all the Jesuits, experts at re-entering through the windows, when they have been thrown out of the door, get this, re-entering through the windows when they had been thrown out of the door had already been successful in putting their colleges into the control of laymen or secular ecclesiastics. So people who favor the policies of the Society of Jesus. That's the point. Even though, oh, sorry, even though not residing in these colleges, so even the Jesuits were not there in person, they could be seen coming in at certain times of the day to perform duties of direction and supervision. But the deceit was discovered, and the Jesuits' colleges were finally closed. In all, the decrees of 1879 were enforced on 32 congregations who refused to submit to the legal dispositions. In many places, the expulsion was carried out by the military arm Manu Malita Militari. Manu is uh, the hand and Militari is the military. So, military arm, military hand. Against the opposition of the faithful aroused by the fathers. These not only refused to ask for the legal authorization, but also refused to sign a declaration disclaiming all idea of opposition to the Republican regime. This would have been enough for Monsieur de Freycinet, then president of the council and favoring them, to still tolerate them. When the orders decided to sign this formal declaration of loyalty, the maneuver had been made void and Monsieur de Freycinet had to resign because he had tried to negotiate this accord against the wishes of Parliament and his colleagues of the Cabinet. Abbé Brugret comments on the declaration of religious orders had to sign and found so repugnant. Quote, this declaration of respect for the institutions France gave herself freely may seem very harmless and inoffensive today, when compared with the solemn oath of loyalty demanded from the German bishops by the Concordat of the 20th of July 1933 between the Holy See and the Third Reich. So we are looking a little bit into the future here. This declaration of respect for the institutions France gave herself freely may seem very harmless and inoffensive today, 
when compared with the solemn oath of loyalty demanded from the German bishops by the Concordat of the 20th of July 1933 between the Holy See and the Reich. Yes, the Concordat, something that we will see later on in this, uh, in this book also. And here I have of course a picture of the Concordat of 1933 that is see that later on also so this is coming back in later readings of the book we have here Ludwig Kahrs who was um, a power in the Centrum party in Germany we have Franz von Papen the Knight of Malta who was the Knight of Malta power behind Adolf Hitler we have uh, Giuseppe Pizzardo who had a high official ranking in the Vatican we have Eugenio Pacelli uh, who was at that time uh, the Minister of, uh, uh, of State uh, in the Vatican and became later Pope Pius XII. We have Alfredo Ottaviani, who also had a high position in the Vatican at that time and I think became Pope uh, John XXIII, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Rudolf Batman, I don't know for the moment, and then we have Giovanni Montini, who later became Pope Paul VI, Antichrist Pope Paul VI. Okay, and they are signing on the 20th of July, as you can see here, the Concordat, the agreement between the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, but we're gonna see that later also, so it's not for today to speak about that but it is mentioned here for the first time and so it is very interesting to see the picture and analyze that a little bit now article 16 uh, states before taking possession of the diocese the bishops will take an oath of loyalty before the president of the reich or a competent reichsstatthalter in the following terms and we're gonna see what the terms following mean but the point is Bishops will take an oath of loyalty, so that means that they are uh, they have to swear their loyalty to the Reich, in this case the German Third Reich, because we are speaking about the Concordat of Germany, 1933. But you know, well, even if they take that oath, they will invoke mental reservation, because their oath they paid to the Pope before this one is higher. They can swear any oath to any country and just invoke mental reservation and by that the Pope will forgive them for the perjury that that is when you speak an oath and you don't mean it. But the Pope will resolve them from the sin of perjury because of mental reservation because in the end the, just, the, the end justifies the means, and the end is that the Roman Catholic Church is going to be advanced and to gain from all these actions. Yeah? Coming back to the Jesuit oath. So in Article 16 of the Concordat in Germany in 1933, it states, before taking possession of their diocese, so before they are... Uh, they they go into their office. The bishops will take an oath of loyalty before the president of the Reich or a competent Reichsstatthalter in the following terms. Means a uh, a, a, a vicarius, <laughs> someone who is in the place of the president of the Reich. Now, listen to this quote: Before God and the Holy Scriptures, I swear and promise, as a bishop should, loyalty. To the German Reich and the state. I swear and promise to respect and make my clergy respect the government established according to the constitutional laws. As is my duty, I will work for the good and in the interests of the German state. In the exercise of the holy ministry entrusted to me, I will try to stop everything which would be detrimental to it. Unquote. This is taken from the Concordat between the Holy See and the German Reich, where we just saw the picture from. So I'm going to call that up again here. I think I have another picture here. This is in black and white. It's the same. It's, it's about the same picture, you see. Maybe he just seated himself a little bit different here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but did you get that? 
the bishops were to swear this oath that we've just read, according to Article 16 of the Concordat, signed on the 20th of July 1933, before God and on and on the Holy Scriptures, on the Bible, I swear and promise, as a bishop should, loyalty to the German Reich and state. Now we know that the Roman Catholic Church does not accept the authority of the Bible, the Holy Scripture, because the Roman Catholic Church says it's the Bible and tradition, and the tradition of the Church supersedes the Holy Scripture, supersedes the Bible. So it doesn't even matter when they do that. And of course they have their mental reservation. I swear and promise to respect and make my clergy respect the government established according to the constitutional laws. Pfft. No! They don't care about this. We really have to understand they can swear anything they want. They will invoke mental reservation and the Pope will forgive them for forgive them for the sin of perjury when they break this oath because the oath that they swore as allegiance to the Pope is superior to any other oath. And when we quote unquote normal people do not know this and do not understand that, we stand there and see all oh, look our Reich, uh, our Kanzler uh, Merkel or whatever in Germany or our President in the United States of America. Bush, Obama, Trump, whatever who comes there, they are swearing allegiance to the United States of America, they are swearing to defend the Constitution, they are swearing to defend the Bill of Rights, they also invoke mental reservation because they are all papists, they are all puppets on the string of the Vatican. They have been here when we are reading about Article 16 of the Concordat between the Roman Holy See and the German Reich, and they are today in the United States of America. Your president, whoever he is, is only paying allegiance to his master in Rome and not to the people who are the people that he swears to defend, or the laws that he swears to uphold, the constitutional laws. What are your constitutional laws in the United States of America worth anyway, when you have a Supreme Court that exists of at least six Roman Catholics and three Jews, and at least five of the judges in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, which is there to interpret the Constitution of the United States of America, at least five of them are members of Opus Dei. What's that worse then? Supreme Court. I just have a new picture of the United States Supreme Court of 2017. And uh, I even have this with, uh, with, the pic uh, with, with, with the names in there, I think. Where is it? Here. The, oh, no, no, that's 2014. Uh, I don't know where that is. So, yeah, let's take this picture then. This is the United States Supreme Court as of 2017. Chief Justices John G. Roberts Jr., Anthony M. Kennedy, Clarence Thomas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen G. Breyer, Samuel Anthony Alito Jr., Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan and Neil Gorsuch. Neil Gorsuch is the latest appointment by Donaldus Trumpius, Donald Trump, the Roman American president. Yeah? When these judges of the Supreme Court are there to interpret a quote-unquote protestant constitution and quote-unquote protestant bill of rights, what do you think they do with it? What have they been doing since 9-11-2001 with it? With the help of the Patriot Act and later on the NDAA? Wake up people! Get a grip! And all these people, all the oaths they swear, they are not worth the paper they are written on because they invoke mental reservation. They don't care what they swear on paper. The only thing that they care of is that they do not sin when they commit perjury. Oh, but they don't do that because the Pope will absolve them of that sin. Because, you know, the Pope can forgive sins, right? I don't think so when I turn to the Bible, but hey, these are Roman Catholics. And Roman Catholics think that 
the Pope can forgive sins. And the Pope will forgive the sin of perjury because of mental reservation. A very important point. Ah, but let's continue reading the book for a moment. The difference is certainly great between a mere promise of non-opposition to France's regime and this solemn pledge to uphold the Nazi state. Just as great as the difference between the two regimes, one democratic and liberal, so hated by the Roman Church, as we can read in the Syllabus of Errors, the other totalitarian and brutally intolerant, wanted and set up by the united efforts of Franz von Papen, the Pope's secret chamberlain, and Monsieur Pacelli of Monsignor Pacelli, Nuncio in Berlin and future Pius XII, as you can see here in this picture. He was Nuncio, means the highest uh, representative of the quote-unquote Holy See of the Vatican between 1917 and 1929. First in Munich, where Hitler appeared at the time after the First World War and where Hitler had his beer putsch in 1923 and then Pacelli went to Berlin. He was the nuncio. He was setting the way into the perdition of the Germans by starting the Third Reich. It is again the Abbé Brugeret who, after having declared that the government's aim had been reached as far as the company of Jesus was concerned, admits also, quote, We could not speak of the destruction of the institution of congregations. The women's congregations had not been touched, and the authorized ones, as dangerous as the others for the lay spirit, were still standing. We knew also that nearly all the men's congregations expelled from their houses because of the decrees of 1880 had quietly gone back to their monasteries. Unquote. Thrown out through the door, climbing, ba climbing back through the window. Let's take this picture again here. But this lull was short-lived. The intention of the state to collect taxes and rights of succession on the wealth of the ecclesiastical communities provoked a general outcry amongst them. Oh, <laughs> you cannot take money from the church. The church is to take money from you, as they had no intention to submit to the common law. No, the spiritual power is above the temporal. The temporal is not telling the spiritual what to do and certainly not taking money of them. Quote, the organization of resistance was the work of a committee directed by the P.P. Bailly, Assumptionist Stanislas A. Capuchin and Lidor, superior of the Eudists. Father Bailly was reviving the great zeal of the clergy by writing, quote, Like St. Laurent, the monks and nuns must go back to the rack or thumbscrews rather than surrender, unquote. What does that mean? <laughs> the monks and nuns must go back to the wreck or thumbscrews rather than surrender? Father Bailly states here as if the Roman Catholics ever got set thumbscrews on like they put on the Protestants during the time of the Inquisition. The perpetrator makes himself the victim here. The monks and nuns must go back to the rack or some screws. The rack or some screws the Roman Catholic Church only used on so-called heretics in the past. Never was used on them. But yeah, you know, the Roman Catholic Church loves to twist the word as they go along. As by accident, the main revivalist of that great zeal, Bailly, was an assumptionist or, in fact, a camouflaged Jesuit. Now what's an assumptionist? Assumption of Mary. A devoted Mariologist he was. As for the wreck and the thumbscrews, we could have reminded the good father that these instruments of torture are in the tradition of the Holy See and not of the one of the Republican state, as I just mentioned. 
Finally, the congregations paid about half of what they owed, and the aforementioned abbe admits that quote, the prosperity of their work was not impaired, unquote, as we can well imagine. We cannot go into details concerning the laws of 1880 and 1886, which tended to assure the confessional neutrality of the state schools. This secularization, which is natural of all, uh, to all tolerant minds, but is rejected by the Roman Church as an abominable attempt at forcing consciences, something she has always claimed for herself. The Roman Catholic Church will not agree with their conscience being forced into something else, the Roman Catholic Church is the institution that forces everybody else into control of their consciences. We would expect her to fight for this so-called right as violently as for her financial privileges. Yeah, I'm quite sure. In 1883, the Roman Congregation of the Index, inspired by Jesuitism, enters the fight by the condemnation of certain school books on moral and civic teaching. Of course, the matter is grave. One of the authors, Paul Baer, dared to write that even the idea of miracles, quote, must vanish before the critical mind, unquote. So, more than 50 bishops promulgate the decree of the index with fulminating comments, and one of them, Monsignor Isoar, declares in his pastoral letter of the 27th of February 1883 that the teachers, the parents, and the children who refuse to destroy these books will be barred from the sacraments meaning they are excommunicated. When you are barred from the sacraments, you cannot get salvation, according to the Roman Catholic Church, of course, not biblical teaching here. Don't misunderstand me. But we are speaking here of what the Roman congregation says, what Paul Ber says, and what Monsignor Isoar declares in his pastoral letter that the teachers, the parents and the children who refuse to destroy these books, which are not in accordance with Roman Catholic teaching, will be barred from the sacraments. So, you will not get communion, you will not get the Eucharist, you cannot marry, you will not be buried by the church when you are barred from the sacraments. So you can get no salvation because the Roman Catholic Church teaches that outside the Roman Catholic Church there is no salvation. So when you are barred from the sacraments, you are anathematized. You are actually excommunicated. So you have to burn all these books which are not in accordance with the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The laws of 1886, 1901 and 1904 declaring that no teaching post could be held by members of religious congregations also started a flood of protestations from the Vatican and the French clergy. But, in fact, the teaching monks and nuns only had to secularize themselves. Now, here we go into something that I could speak for in own video of, and I did in the past. In fact, the teaching monks and nuns only had to secularize themselves. Why am I highlighting this little sentence? Because this is exactly what happened to the whole Society of Jesus between the time of 1773 and 1814. The, the time when Pope Clement XIV banned the Jesuits with the papal bull Dominic Ac Redemptor, and then Pope Pius VII reinstalled the Jesuits in 1814. In the meantime, what did they do? They secularized themselves. And this is why John Adams, the former American president, speaks about them, that they come into the United States of America in swarms and in disguises as only the king of the gypsies can assume. 
the only positive result of these legal dispositions was that the professors of the schools so-called free huh, so-called free schools had from now on to produce adequate pedagogic qualifications a good thing when we know that before the last war the catholic primary schools in france numbered 11,655 uh, with in total 824,595 pupils as for the free colleges and especially the jesuits if their number is being reduced it is because of several factors which have nothing to do with the legal wrangles the superior, superiority of the university's teaching acknowledged by the majority of parents and more recently its being without change are the main causes for its growing popularity besides the society of jesus has voluntarily reduced the number of its schools <laughs> yeah because they just took another name and this brings us to the end of chapter 7 and we will continue next time in chapter 8 the jesuits and general boulanger and the jesuits and the dreyfus affair a very interesting subject that we will dig into in the next reading when i come back to read and discuss another part of the book the secret history of the jesuits by edmond paris published in 1975. so i had a five to ten minutes introduction about uh, this bill you stuff so that's why it's a little bit more than one hour today but i thought that very important to do and um, i thank you all for watching and listening and um, get a copy of the book buy it for yourself you know my brother brad norman sent me a copy of that book from chick publications the secret history of the jesuits so when i'm not at the computer i read in this book and otherwise i decided to do the book reading with the help of the pdf because then i don't have to produce an extra video but uh, you can get that book from chick publications um, and um, there's an ISBN number on here I think I will put that also into the description box of this video that you can get that book and otherwise of course I will uh, I will um, uh, I will give you the uh, download link uh, where you can download this book so you can read along or you can even read for yourself you know you, you don't need me to read this it's just that I think that everything else that I have to say next to the reading is also maybe interesting so anyway, not making this too long, uh, on the Sabbath day I still have something to do and later on I'm looking forward to my Bible study with Tom Fress and Brett Norman. So I will leave it here after an hour and ten minutes all about and uh, wish you uh, a wonderful day, a wonderful Sabbath wherever you are. May God protect you and bless you wherever you are. And until next time, Jokla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off and bye bye. A special eye work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions and the purpose of that infiltration was what for well the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day. Lord has made.
Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these uh, this dangerous goal of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From their own, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.